You are listening to Proof Text, a Glossa House podcast by Dr. T. Michael W. Halcom, Dr. Frederick J. Long, Dr. Mario Melendez, Dr. Jennifer Noonan, and J. M. Smith. Welcome and enjoy. Hello and welcome to Proof Text. I am Michael Halcom, and this is a Fallacy of the Week episode. And as always, we've got an interesting one for you. Uh, this one was sent to me by my friend Jeremy recently, um, and or at least alerted to me by my friend Jeremy, and uh, it was posted on social media, so it's out there floating around, and I thought, boy, this is problematic. So I'm going to show you what I saw here on the screen. So if you're watching, you're going to get to see it, but if you're just listening, then you'll uh, I'll read it out to you, and you'll hear it. So this was posted by the famous Bethel the sort of charismatic Bethel music group, and um, particularly by someone named Chris Velatan. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying the last name right there, but Vyatan or Velatan. Um, but yeah, this was posted on the Bethel social media, and it says this, prayer is an act of leadership as it authorizes God to do his will on our planet. All right, so almost every line of this, uh, there's five lines here, but almost every line of this is problematic in a way. Um, So let's just look at this, right? But the overall, say the whole thought is very problematic. There's a lot of of logical fallacy stuff going on here. But the first two lines, prayer is an act of leadership. Okay, I've never, ever heard anybody define prayer as an act of leadership except this person. And that doesn't mean that it's wrong because nobody else ever defined it that way. But to say prayer equals leadership, okay, if you're going to define it that way, then, or you're going to say that, then you got to define it. Like justify that, um, that point. Prayer equals leadership. Prayer is an act of leadership. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But then it says it's an act of leadership as it authorizes God. Okay, so we are the ones that have to authorize God to do something? Okay. I thought he was the sovereign one, not us. Um, It authorizes God to do his will. So God needs authorization from us to do his will? Doesn't sound very sovereign to me. Authorizes God to do his will on our planet. Okay, I thought it was his planet, not ours. Okay, so those are some of just the surface things I'm seeing here. Again, every line is pretty much problematic. But let's think of this in terms of like just very specific logical fallacies. And the, the first one that comes to my mind is what we would call circular reasoning or begging the question. All right, so begging the question or circular reasoning it happens when somebody assumes that something is true without giving proof. Uh, you're, you're essentially saying uh, that, that's the statement is what it is, right? Um, or something is true because it is what it is. Well, no, give me the proof for that. So you're you're just saying it's true, but I need the proof for it. Um, and this statement assumes um, without proof. That prayer authorizes God to act. So if you're going to say our prayers authorize God to act, prove that. Prove it to us. From where are you getting this? Okay. Um, (laughs) And so I guess another thing we could say, like if you think of the statement, um, uh, prayer works because it works. Prayer is true because it's true. Right? Like, Scripture true because it's true. Christianity is true because it's true. This is all problematic. It's just circular reasoning, begging, in the, question, begging the question. Right? Um, well, I heard a lot of people say, well, the Bible's true because it's the Word of God. And we know it's the Word of God because it's true. Well, that's circular reasoning. So we have that going on here because, again, it's assuming that prayer authorizes God to act. Um, it's again, prayer works because it works, or you're saying um, prayer authorizes God to act, and God acts because he's authorized by our prayers to. 
it's just it's circular reasoning begging the question and it's bad theology it's actually just bad logic it's bad theologic but it's really bad logic um another thing that i see going on here's what in in terms of logical fallacies is known as a non sequitur and a non sequitur just literally means in latin it does not follow or does not follow right so the idea here for a non sequitur fallacy is when your conclusion doesn't logically follow from your premise. So here you have a premise, here you have a conclusion, and the premise is supposed to lead us to the conclusion. But in a non sequitur, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premise. Um, so, for example, if you're working on math homework and uh, you get an answer right, as soon as it starts raining, you're thinking, oh, it's raining. So I must be good at math. Or you could say it the other way. Um, I'm so good at math, I made it rain. Right? It, uh, it's a non sequitur in both directions. The, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premise. And what we see in the statement given here, um, it's claiming that praying is leading and that this sort of leading gives God permission. But it actually doesn't logically explain how one leads to the other how how praying is leading and then that leading is something that gives god permission again like um you know i'm wearing a yellow shirt so i must be a good podcaster well the the conclusion isn't connected to the premise and it's the same here um praying is leading and gives god permission so even if praying is leading how in the world do we arrive at the conclusion that, that gives God permission? This is terrible logic. Um, we also, I think, have maybe um, a little bit of special pleading going on here. It's a fallacy as well. That's when <laughs> we see this a lot um, in politics. We see it a lot even in church politics. But um, you can see it especially when kids are making, like, playing a game on the playground, right? It's making a rule up. And then saying that it applies to everyone else, um, but maybe not you. And then it, you don't give a good reason for why it doesn't apply to you, right? Uh, so here in this example, the, this Bethel post, um, what we see going on is that we have uh, human concepts of leadership um, in human concepts of even giving authority and authorization, so human concepts of leadership and authorizing God, without ever explaining why a human concept of leadership or a human authorizing God should apply to a divine entity at all. Right? And so, for example, we could argue that uh, all, all environmental laws should apply to all countries in the world except us. And then we don't give a valid reason for why we should be exempt from that, right? What we have going on here is that, oh, this human concept um, of leadership should be applied to God, but then we don't ever give, give a reason for why, right? Uh, so this is problematic, very, very problematic, the special pleading going on. Um, I'll just point out one more that I think I see here. It's what we, we would call anthropomorphism. Now, this isn't always wrong. This isn't always fallacious. But um, in this case, it may well be an anthropomorphism. It's a big, fancy word. It's basically just um, uh, when we have the thought that non-human entities like animals or gods have human traits or emotions or we apply human traits or emotions to a non-human entity like a divine one or an animal one, right? So in this post, we see a sort of anthropomorphism gone wrong, I think, because it's suggesting that God needs human permission or human-like permission to act. And it's attributing a human action to a divine being. This is actually the worst kind of anthropomorphism, perhaps. Um, this is like uh, I have an, a dog who's like... 14 or 15 years old, and the dog has been having trouble in the last few minutes jumping up onto the couch. Instead, every time it tries to jump, it doesn't make it, it falls back down. And now I could say, oh, look, the dog's embarrassed. 
And in that case, I would be applying human feelings or emotions to the dog, but the dog's not embarrassed, right? Um, I'm projecting a human emotion onto the dog. And in this post, this Bethel post, it's projecting a, a, a human trait, needing permission to act, needing authorization to act. It's projecting that human thing, that human trait, on to God, who is a divine being. So it actually maybe overlaps here with uh, that special pleading a little bit, but anthropomorphism sort of gone wrong, gone awry, gone off the rails here. So no, God uh, doesn't need, a prayer isn't leadership, and prayer isn't leadership that authorizes God, and prayer isn't leadership that authorizes God to do his will. God doesn't need our authorization, and he certainly doesn't need our authorization to do his will. Um, and this is not our planet. It's God's planet. So, yeah, I'll stop there. This, <laughs> uh, we, we have to pay attention when we see these posts. They may they look and sound creative, and they're all decorated up, and they're kind of catchy, but it's terrible logic. Terrible logic. Terrible theologic. So, yeah, I'm going to stop there, and I'll say I hope that helps. Interested in growing your ancient language skills but not sure where to start? Glow's House can help. From illustrated readers and short stories to lexicons and grammars, Glow's House offers a variety of resources for beginning, intermediate, and experienced ancient language learners. Head to glowsahouse.com today. Glow's House, language resources for the global community.